and I wrote some notes down because I don't want to miss anything and I didn't get a chance to upload it to you guys. So um, this lecture will be about the co-contributing factors to addiction and mental health issues, as well as evidence-based treatments that may improve treatment outcomes. Now we come a long way with therapeutic interventions, psychological interventions, trauma work, uh, cultural differences that we address, uh, life skill training and things of that nature. But I'm gonna take a little different uh, approach to looking at addiction and mental health. First, we will look at the current model for addiction in the United States. This 28-day program is based on the 70-year-old model that was designed basically for alcoholism. As we know today, that drugs are so powerful that it changes the dynamics on how we need to treat this disease. In my opinion, we need to consider a 60 to 90 day treatment depending on the severity of the illness, plus a strong aftercare program for a minimum of at least one year. The brain needs time to heal and create new behaviors that are beneficial to recovery. Now, let's talk about detox centers. In my opinion, they should be called stabilization units because the word detox means to detoxify, not to put other toxins in. One of the best protocols to stabilize someone coming off of drugs and alcohol is a plant medicine called Ibogaine. For the past 20 years, I worked with a colleague of mine, Dr. Deborah Mash, a pioneer in Ibogaine treatment. When done under medical supervision, in my opinion, is the best way to stabilize someone on drugs, primarily opiates and alcohol. Ibogaine is a bush from West Africa that is utilized by the Weedy tribe. They use it as a rite of passage. This plant medicine was discovered by a gentleman called Howard Lutzoff. He was a heroin addict who wanted to find a new high in new Ibogaine had a psychedelic properties. So he took it and woke up the next morning to his surprise, completely detoxed from opiates and he had no cravings. This shocked him. So he decided to open up a treatment center to help addicts get off of opiates and alcohol. He asked Dr. Deborah Mash to join him in treating addicts and alcoholics with Ibogaine. Eventually, Dr. Mash opened up her own program in St. Kitts. She turned it into a research project and found incredible results. Clients came out of Ibogaine treatment completely detoxed within 24 to 36 hours with minimal residual effects and without any cravings. When done under proper medical supervision, it is a very safe detox. They also experienced some of their traumas they had in early childhood and had what I call a cathartic experience. In other words, a resolution to these traumas. Currently, Dr. Mash is undergoing FDA trials for Ibogaine treatment. Now, I firmly remit, uh, recommend Ibogaine. I worked with Dr. Mash for 20 years, and I've seen numerous amount of people get well. Now, a lot of underground people are doing Ibogaine, and people may have died from Ibogaine because they didn't use a medical model where we put a heart monitor on them for 24 hours and make sure their heart was in good condition. We gave them uh, toxicology tests to see what's on board. We do blood work with them. Uh, we did a psychological approach to see what's going on with them psychologically. Um, and then we took them to St. Kitts. And then we prepared them for the Ibogaine journey. It was an incredible experience that I worked with her for 12 years on the island of St. Kitts. And what we did was we would have them come in and lay on a bed, a hospital bed. We put an IV in their arms. So in case there's any kind of an event, a heart monitor on them, just make sure everything is going well. We put uh, eye, eye uh, shades on them and headset on them with music to keep them in a containment field. Then we would give them a test dose and for 45 minutes, if they tolerated, we would give them a full dose. And my job was to help them to extrapolate out all the information that came out of their journey. So that's one of the things that I wanted to talk about because I think it needs uh, more investigation. Currently she's under the FDA trials looking at this as a, a treatment for detoxing people. Now, <clears throat> you know, we, we, we have it down really well with the psychological model 
for, for doing treatment. Uh, we have trauma work, we have all kinds of different approaches, but there's some things that we're missing, I believe. The co-contributing factors to addiction, <clears throat> excuse me. So what are they? Well, you know, we know that when clients get depressed and have anxiety, they tend to want to medicate. So I want to know what are the core issues, what's driving the anxiety and what's driving the depression. So what I looked into was some really simple factors. Number one, low thyroid, hypothyroidism, causes depression and anxiety. Number two, leaky gut syndrome, causes depression and anxiety. H. pylori or infection causes depression and anxiety. Hypoglycemia, especially with alcoholics, causes depression and anxiety. Closed head injuries causes depression, anxiety, and behavioral problems. <clears throat> Excuse me. We're not looking at these things. We're only looking at a psychological model. We're not looking at the drivers that may be driving these depression and this anxiety, which is causing people to want to medicate. So the gut, the microbiome or the microbiota is what, excuse me, let me get a little water. <clears throat> the gut is the second brain. And more and more research is coming out about the gut, the microbiome and the microbiota. That's the flora in the gut. And what we're looking at is autoimmune diseases. Um, most people don't realize that 90% of dopamine and serotonin, the feel-good drug that's manufactured in the gut that goes up the vagus nerve into the brain and deposits it, deposits the dopamine and serotonin in the brain is manufactured in the gut. So if you look at, if we're not looking at, we need a comprehensive approach when we're looking at addicts and when we're doing our intake. First of all, we gotta look at their diet. We gotta look at their water intake. We gotta look at their sleep patterns. There are multiple things that we need to look at besides the psychological issue. Now, a lot of people don't realize that the body is actually connected to the head. I always say that because if we only wanna treat the head, let's send the head to treatment and leave the body behind. <clears throat> It's very important that we look at the whole person. Yes, there are a lot of other things that co-contribute to addiction and mental health issues. I understand that. I understand about trauma. I understand about early childhood uh, problems that we have growing up, uh, cultural issues, and on and on and on. And we're doing really well with that. But we're missing out on the medical part. Why aren't we looking at that? And also genetics. I work with um, Dr. Ken Blum. He's the geneticist who found the addiction gene. And there is an addiction gene, by the way. It was founded in 1976 by Dr. Blum and Ernie Noble. It's the DRD2 ALE1 variant gene. Now, just because you have that gene doesn't mean you're going to become an addict. Because there's such a thing, as you know, as epigenetics. Epigenetics means the social environment can change the gene expression. So we need to look at a lot of different things because if we continue to do the same thing over and over again, expecting results, different results, we know what that means, all right? Definitely the definition of insanity. There's only a five to 8% recovery rate in addiction and mental health. Compliance is one of the major issues also. So we need to take a look at holistically Everything about addiction and mental health treatment. It's very difficult to treat somebody if you're only going to treat part of them. So we need to take a look. There's a gene test they call the GARS test, genetic addiction risk score that Dr. Blum developed to see if people have a mild, moderate, or severe propensity for addiction. He also developed an amino acid compound. Now we did 15 studies, peer-reviewed studies, uh, the gold standard double blind study on these amino acid compounds. And we found out that it upregulates dopamine, which is paramount for people to be feeling good about themselves and for recovery. 
We also found out that a lot of clients are deficient in certain nutrients, which can cause other problems, mental issue problems, the medical problems. So you can do a micronutrient test to see what's going on with them. Another issue that we're not looking at is heavy metals. Heavy metal toxicity, okay, causes neurotransmission disruption. It also can mimic bipolar disorder and attention deficit disorder. We need to look at these things and we need to address them, but we don't, unfortunately, because we're not trained to do such a thing. People's food intake, we're not really looking at that. They think most addicts and alcoholics, they sugar, uh, processed food, uh, they're so unhealthy. You know, we need to show them the different diets to take, even though they may or may not do it, but at least we're imparting that information to them. Exercise program, paramount. Exercise depletes stress. Stress depletes dopamine. And exercise improves dopamine. So we need to put them on that kind of program along with all the other psychological programs. Now I'm a recovering addict. I'm in recovery now going on 37 years. I've been treating addiction for about 35 of those 37 years. I'm also in about 76, I think, medical and peer reviewed journals. I work with scientists and researchers from all over the world on these addiction problems, things that we're not looking at. Now, it's one of the things that we can do to heal the brain is hyperbarics. I work with a doctor, Paul Harch. Now, Dr. Harch is a pioneer in hyperbaric medicine. You can look him up. Uh, he's an incredible scientist. They found out that hyperbarics, in the beginning, it's about 100 years old when hyperbarics came about. They used it for the bends. People dive deep in the ocean, had to come back up, and they have to normalize their blood. And then they found out it heals wounds. Now, Dr. Harch and Dr. Williamson went to the Senate and got them to approve wound healing for diabetics in the VA. And they saved many people with their arms being cut off, their legs being cut off, and et cetera. Then through further research, they found out that it also helps with TBI cases, traumatic brain injury cases, which is also unbelievable how it helps people. It's very interesting that hyperbarics, which is oxygen under pressure, is an incredible technology. I always ask people, well, what do you do for pause? Post-acute withdrawal syndrome. And they always say, well, um, time. That means they don't know. If you put somebody in a hyperbaric chamber, believe it or not, pause just melts away. How do I know that? Because we used to use that in my treatment center. So I know it works. Same with detoxing people off of heavy metals. Same with using amino acids. Same with changing their diet. We've had the worst of the worst clients come to us. Unbelievable how sick clients are getting today, especially with fentanyl and, and all these other drugs and these designer drugs. Clients are coming in sicker than I've ever seen them. And we need to look at them comprehensively. You know, I'm just honored to be with all these different people that are lecturing here today because everybody has a piece of the pie. See, I'm Italian, so I like pizza. And I look at recovery and addiction treatment as a pizza. You have spirituality, you have uh, uh, exercise, you have diet, you have therapy sessions they need, and on and on and on. There's a lot of different things that addicts and alcoholics know, need, especially people in general, especially with COVID, all the depression and all the anxiety that's going on, that people do not have the skills to deal with it. And what happens is, See, we look at addiction, Dr. Dr. Blum has a term called RDS. It's called reward deficiency syndrome. Now, what does all, all that mean? Well, what that means is, okay, it's a deficiency in dopamine and serotonin. And that's what causes people to start going off the rails. Because addicts look for dopamine and serotonin in drugs and alcohol and behaviors and when we call it RDS, it's because it's not just about drugs and alcohol. Addicts hop from one thing to another and back to the drug of choice. There's behaviors. There's 
sex addiction. There's gambling addiction. There's people that have eating disorders, food addiction. It goes on and on and on. Now, what is addiction? Real simple term is when you continue to use a substance or a behavior in spite of, in spite of adverse consequences. And this is what we have to look at, okay, that the way to treat this is really, really important. And therapists need to learn how to be in rapport with clients because just reading from a book and learning, you know, and what you learn in college and what you learn in school uh, really doesn't work well for addicts because they don't believe in anybody anyway because they don't believe in themselves. So it's very, very important that we get into rapport with the client so at least maybe they can absorb some of the information that we want to give them. This is so important in treatment. Now, I've had a treatment center, a 62-bed inpatient facility. We did hyperbarics. We did massage therapy. Now, what does massage therapy do? It's not something fancy. First of all, drugs and alcohol are housed in cellular level on the, in the body. And there's such a thing as called lymphatic massage. They help clean the body out. Saunas, also very important. Nutrients, very important. Acupuncture, it's only 5,000 years old. What are they now? Acupuncture actually helps to calm them down, to help them with cravings, and helps get the energy in their body aligned so they can think better. Same with chiropractics, to align the spine so the energy flows to the body properly. We have to start looking at Eastern philosophies, not just Western. We have to see Western philosophy, we always try to we fix things after they're broken. Eastern is to fix it before it's broken. We need to look at it that way. Unfortunately, treatment is not done uh, by the treatment centers. It's done by the insurance companies. And what I mean by that, real simple, okay? They don't allow us to do a lot of things that really work, unfortunately. And what they do is they try to, their job is to make money and not pay. Our job is to make money, okay, and get paid. And, uh, and then you have this dynamic going back and forth. And the healthcare system in the United States is really terrible. And the insurance companies need to be, uh, they need to have some oversight. Because what's going on is a lot of addicts uh, are dying. 93,000 addicts OD last year from, from, mostly from fentanyl, I believe. And it's so sad. So we have to broaden our view of addiction more so from a medical model, not just a psychological model. That's so important. And all I could say is this, there are so many things that we could do. There's light therapy that helps with depression. There's um, sound therapy that also helps. There's a lot of different modalities out there that really work. Don't believe a word I tell you. And I always tell people that, go look for yourself. Do some investigations. Get out of your box and go to a little different box and see what happens. All right, so this is what I have to share with all of you. I hope I address some of the issues and some of the things, okay? And uh, God bless all of you. And thank you for allowing me to share this information.